Hello, welcome to this lesson on naming ionic compounds. Today's question, what is the importance of scientists all over the world using the same periodic table, even if they don't speak the same language? A compound is a pure substance, which is formed when two or more elements bond together. What I mean by a pure substance is that it is either an element or a compound, and that um, there are no impurities, meaning, let me explain the opposite. <laughs> An impure substance would be something like salt water. The amount of salt in the water can change. You can have water that's kind of salty or water that's super salty. But the compound H2O will always have two hydrogens bonded to one oxygen. So that's what makes it pure, is that the uh, chemical formula is definitive and highly predictable. Everybody guesses and gets the right answer. So that's kind of what we're talking about in terms of a pure substance and a compound is a type of pure substance. Specifically, a binary compound is a compound that is made of two elements. Think of H2O. Even though there's three atoms there, it's made of hydrogen and oxygen and that's what makes it the binary compound. We have some rules for how we name compounds in chemistry. We can't just name every chemical or compound or new thing that we make after people or who built them originally, who discovered them, because it would be a lot to keep up with. So there's actually a group of scientists. Uh, they are called the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, which we often just say IUPAC, I-U-P-A-C. And they kind of came up with the rules for how we were going to name compounds. This way, if I tell you the name of a compound, you can pretty much know what it's made of. And if you told me what a compound is made of, we can come up with a name for it very easily. Um, and it's kind of like um, names, like names for people. If somebody had the name um, Mario and maybe his brother was Luigi, you would probably assume that the two brothers were Italian because those are Italian names, right? They're classically Italian. Of course, with people, we can name people really anything that we want, um, but there are some names that are classically going to fit like one culture or another. If somebody has the last name McCarthy, they probably are Irish. So you can kind of piece these together. Um, and that's kind of the idea with these compound names is that the name of the compound is gonna tell you a little bit about it. So we have these rules and they're a lot easier than you may think. Anytime we have a binary ionic compound, we are going to name it in this way. And part of the reason for the rules is going to indicate that this compound has ionic bonds. And then secondly, it is going to, um, in some cases, tell us the charge of a metal ion, and it's gonna tell us the um, elements that are bonded and in what ratios. So to begin, we are always going to list the name of the cation, which is the positive ion, which most of the time is going to be a metal. It just has its name listed, just like it's named on the periodic table. So if we had lithium bonded to chlorine, we would just say lithium. And that's the first part of the name. Now, the second element is going to be the anion, the negative ion. And we are going to change the ending of that uh, element's name to end in ide. I-D-E. So you may have heard of fluoride in your toothpaste. That means that you have a, a compound where fluorine is bonded to something else to turn it into fluoride. So I like to think of this as the two elements getting married. Remember, the cation is going to give electrons, or maybe just one, to the anion, kind of like in a classic situation. Um, the man would give the woman an engagement ring right? Um, so he gives a ring and then she is going to go and change her name. When I got married, I changed my last name. A lot of people don't anymore, but if we're thinking like really old school, this is how it used to be done. Um, so the anion is going to change its name. It's the negative ion. It's kind of like the girl and she gets married and changes her name. So every time that we have an anion that is now bonded to something else, it is going to change its ending to ide to indicate, hey, I'm bonded now. So that's how I like to think about it. Take a minute and see if you can figure out how to name these particular compounds.
CaCl2 is calcium bonded to chlorine and calcium is going to keep its name just like in a traditional marriage and then the chlorine is going to change her name to chloride to indicate that she is now bonded. Then we have K2S which is potassium sulfide. AlBr3 is aluminum bromide and Na2O is sodium oxide. Now the point where you go and take the uh, element's name and kind of like chop off the ending and put the eyed on, there's no set formula or rule for that. Um, you kind of just have to figure it out as you go. Um, I know a lot of my students try to write sulfuride. You get used to it in time. It's sulfide, um, bromide, oxide. It comes with time. Other times we have a chemical formula and we need to determine its name. So again, if we are doing this for a binary ionic compound, we are going to look at the elements that are in there and figure out its charges using the periodic table. So if it's a member of group one, it's gonna have a plus one charge, group two is plus two, and then the non-metals, group 17 is minus one, group 16 is minus two, group 15 is minus three, Remember, 18 doesn't bond, so their um, charge is going to be zero, and use the periodic table. Then you're going to crisscross the charges. Remember, don't touch the sign. That's not the important part in this case. Um, we're just going to crisscross those numbers, and then we're going to check to see if we can reduce those numbers. See if you can come up with the formula for these chemicals. Lithium nitride would be Li3N, and here's how you would do it. Lithium on the periodic table is in group one, so its charge will be plus one. Nitrogen is in group 15 with five valence electrons. It needs three more, meaning it'll take on a minus three charge. Crisscross those, can't reduce, so you have Li3N. Um, and then you would follow through for the rest of these. I will tell you that magnesium oxide was reduced. Magnesium has a plus two charge and oxygen has a minus two charge. And then those twos uh, reduced when they crisscross. So you just get MgO. Same with the barium sulfide. Uh, barium's plus two and sulfur is minus two. Let's not forget about those pesky transition metals. They have one extra tiny rule added when we are trying to name them. So uh, it's called the stock system and that's what we use for naming transition metals. The rules honestly don't change all that much. There's just one tiny thing we have to add and that is the Roman numeral to indicate what the charge was on that metal ion when it crisscrossed. And the reason we have to indicate it is because the transition metals can rearrange their inner electrons to change the number of valence electrons that they're bonding with. So if I told you that copper was bonding to chlorine, there is absolutely no way from just my statement to know how many electrons are being exchanged in that situation. Sometimes copper gives away one electron, other times it gives away two. So we could take a guess, but there's no guarantee that we're right. So um, that is why we need that Roman numeral to indicate whether it's one or two electrons. So this is what it would look like. Here we have cobalt two oxide, and that's exactly how you would read it. So the question is, what would be the formula for cobalt two oxide? So what you're gonna do is find um, the charge of the non-metal using the periodic table. The name here gives you the charge of the transition metal, and then all you'll have to do is crisscross and maybe reduce. Cobalt two oxide, cobalt has a plus two charge, oxygen has a minus two charge, when you crisscross those, your twos are going to reduce each other and you're left with COO, watch the capitals. Then we have iron three sulfide, which gives us Fe2S3. Vanadium chloride, I added this on purpose because there's a lot of kids that make this mistake, uh, specifically with vanadium. That V after vanadium is not really its chemical symbol. I mean, it is. Vanadium is represented by a V on the periodic table, but that V really means that vanadium is bonding with five electrons. So um, this would be vanadium plus five crisscrossing with a chlorine minus one. Then finally, we have gold one hydride, each with a charge of one. Gold is plus one and hydrogen is minus one. So we don't write either of the ones when we write the final proper answer.
Can you do it backwards? Let's see. This is nickel two chloride. And I know this because if I uncrisscross, this two came from up here on the nickel. So nickel has a plus two charge, nickel two. And then an imaginary one had come from the chlorine, which makes perfect sense. So this is just nickel two chloride. There was no reducing in this case. Then I have copper two sulfide, but there are no subscripts here. So this tells me that because sulfur is a member of group 16, it'll always be minus two. And because there's no subscript behind the sulfur, um, and there's none in between the copper and the sulfur, I would assume that both of those subscripts were either one or they were the same number when it was reduced. So this uh, very clearly had to have been copper plus two in order for the two on the sulfur to disappear, copper two sulfide. Nickel three bromide is a simple uncrisscross because bromine is always a minus one, which is not a surprise with an imaginary one right there. And then finally, we have titanium four oxide, and this one's a little tricky. There is nothing between the titanium and the oxygen indicating that oxygen might have been minus one, but I know that oxygen will never be minus one because oxygen is always looking to gain two valence electrons since it has six on its own. Um, so if oxygen was a two up here and then was reduced to a one when it crisscrossed, it got cut in half, meaning that this two had to also have been cut in half, indicating that titanium originally was a plus four. So we have titanium four oxide. The last set of rules for naming ionic compounds involves compounds that have polyatomic ions. Anytime there's a polyatomic ion in an ionic compound, you don't change its name. You just leave it as it is. Um, so the names of the ions are not changed. And depending on the metal, we might need a Roman numeral. We will need a Roman numeral if it is a transition metal from the D block or the center section of the periodic table. So here we have magnesium bonded to sulfate and you just name it as it is. We would, same rule as before, take this magnesium, just drop its name because it's the cation, and then sulfate, you don't change the name of the poly either. So this would just be magnesium sulfate. This right here is two polyatomic ions bonded together. There is not a metal in here at all, but it is an ionic bond. And that's because this NH4 is called ammonium. That is an ion. And then CO3 is a polyatomic ion called carbonate. You do not have to have a metal to have an ionic bond. This is one of the very few exceptions where you have an ionic bond with no metal. So because they're both polys, we are not going to change the names at all. See if you can finish this out. This second example turned out to be ammonium carbonate. No renaming at all. Manganese 4. I was going to say seven. Manganese for dichromate. Um, manganese is a transition metal, so it requires a uh, Roman numeral to indicate the charge. And dichromate is Cr2O7, which has a minus two charge. So because it went from minus two down to imaginary one, that means when it came down on the crisscross, it got cut in half, meaning that... Um, the charge on the manganese had to have been cut in half to become a two, leaving us with manganese four dichromate. And then barium does not require a Roman numeral because it's not a transition metals. It's just, mari uh, it's just barium. And then we have NO2, which is the polyatomic ion nitrite. So this would just be barium nitrite. See if you can come up with a formula for these. Ammonium, I recognize as a polyatomic ion, and its formula is NH4. When I bond that to chloride, that really means I'm bonding to chlorine, and I'm going to take each of the charges on those. Ammonium is plus one, chlorine is minus one, crisscross them because they're both ones. You just drop them, you don't really need them, and you're left with NH4Cl. Potassium permanganate. Um, potassium is a group one metal with a plus one charge and permanganate is a poly with a minus one charge. Crisscross those and you get KMnO4. Sodium chlorate. Sodium is a plus one. Chlorate is a minus one. Crisscross the ones, they drop and you get NaClO3. Lead to nitrate. Lead... <laughs> Lead to nitrate. 
Lead is PB. The two literally tells you it's a plus two. You don't have to look it up. And then you have nitrate, which is NO3 with a minus one charge. Crisscross that. Don't forget to put your nitrate in parentheses so you don't accidentally have 32 oxygens and you would get PB NO3 two. Last up, we have silver chromate. Silver is in the transition metal section, but it'll pretty much always be plus one. I think it actually is always plus one. Um, some of the transition metals, your teacher may have you memorize their most common charges. Um, silver is pretty much always plus one. So there you have it. Because silver is plus one, um, it technically does not need a Roman numeral, although because it's a transition metal, I probably should have put one. And then we have chromate, which is CrO4 with a minus two charge. Crisscross those because the silver is always one. The chromate does not need parentheses. We would just get Ag2CrO4. That is all I have for you on ionic naming for today. Um, please make sure to leave any questions you have in the comment section below the video. Subscribe so you don't miss the next lesson. I'll see you there. Bye.